Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Kalamea. And I'm Amy Gosha. Welcome to The Divorce at Altitude, a podcast on Colorado family law. Divorce is not easy. It really sucks. Trust me, I know. Besides being an experienced divorce attorney, I'm also a divorce client. Whether you are someone considering divorce or a fellow family law attorney, listen in for weekly tips and insight into topics related to divorce, co-parenting, and separation in Colorado. Welcome to another episode of Divorce at Altitude. I'm Ryan Kalamea, joined with my co-host, Amy Gosha. We're excited to bring on our first guest ever, uh, James Bailey. Uh, Jim is a family law attorney based in Denver. He was born and raised in Denver uh, before graduating as the valedictorian of his graduating class at the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law in 1992. Uh, After law school, he clerked for the Chief Justice uh, Luis Rivera at the Colorado Supreme Court before entering private practice. Jim has received numerous awards, such as being named a Colorado Super Lawyer and Best Lawyers in America. He has written about marital agreements, including uh, the use of experts in domestic relations cases in the Practitioner's Guide to Colorado Domestic Relations Law. He has given numerous presentations, including one that I attended in 2014. Amy, I think you were there as well on the new Uniform Marital and Premarital Agreement Act at the Family Law Institute. He's a member of the faculty at uh, NIDA in Boulder. Um, Presently, he is a shareholder at SVC uh, law firm in Denver and leads their litigation and family law team. Did I cover everything, Jim? That sounds pretty close, yeah. Well, welcome. How are you doing? You know, it's good. It's a nice snowy day today, so it's good to be inside. (laughs) Indeed. Well, I thought where we'd start off is with a story just to kind of provide a a framework for our discussion today on challenging uh, premarital agreements. Uh, And so what we've done on the show is to have, uh, you know, Eric um, Wolf as uh, a hypothetical uh, client. And we you know, told the story in our first episode about how he's in, you know, the counselor's office and his wife tells him that she's hired a divorce lawyer and he's running through these various issues in his head about his business and what's going to happen with the house. Um, Let's assume that, you know, he feels a sense of relief, which was in the original story, but he, he also feels a sense of relief because he got a premarital agreement before Melanie and him ever got married. And he used a general practitioner uh, to draft the the agreement for him. Uh, He's got a copy of the agreement. It's got a financial statement attached. It isn't dated or initialed. uh, And Melanie didn't do a financial statement. And uh, he comes into your office. Uh, What is the kind of process um, of that that meeting uh, with Eric Wolf and and you, Jim? Yeah, the... <clears throat> the first meeting is always a triage. We're going to be sitting back and we're going to have some conversations about what's the magnitude of the marital estate, what are our risks, what are our you know benefits of proceeding. And once we start to get into the uh, a premarital agreement, I'm going to call the marital agreements to be overbroad. Once we get into that specific rubric, we're going to really sit back and have a conversation about what's going on with that how it impacts the various obligations. And it's probably the piece of paper I'm going to ask for him to hand me to read. It's the first one because it really can be significant. So, and and I don't know about your practice, but, you know, the tax returns and some, some of those core documents. So that would be, that's often helpful. And in this case, you would certainly ask him ahead of time or, you know, the first thing you would ask is the pre is, is the copy of the agreement, right? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I always try to get a client to come into that first conference with a, a fairly broad assortment of the, and I'm going to use a bad word, which is the Form 35-1 disclosures, which are the mandatory disclosures. There'll be tax returns, bank account statements, uh, business financials. It really gives me a description of what the marital estate is looking like. I'm also usually asking for kind of a handwritten summary of, hey, here's what I think it is, which helps accelerate it. The moment I hear prenuptial agreement, that that's going to be the first issue. And yes, 
um, I'm actually going to ask him to send it to me by email these days so I can take a look at it and try to prep up what it might mean for the meeting. Okay, so you get the agreement. What are the things you're specifically looking for? Well, the first thing I, when I get it is I'm going to actually scroll down to the end. Um, I'm going to want to make sure it's signed. I want to see what the date is of the agreement. I want to see if there are disclosures. I want to see what the disclosures look like. And so we're really kind of focusing in on some of the defenses that exist for the marital agreement with that analysis. So you've said this agreement is undated. We're going to have a conversation about that. That's going to be the topic of where almost the next series of questions is going to be. Um, it's my understanding that the wife did not tender a set of disclosures. We're going to have a conversation about that. How come there's only one set of disclosures? Then I'm going to go back through with really a second cut um, where I'm going to try to highlight some of the issues, you know, to go through here and to say, how does it treat property? How is separate property defined? How is marital property defined? Is there a maintenance waiver here? Does this have a severability clause that's associated with it? And trying to get a very broad brush of um, what this agreement might mean, and then to have a conversation about it. And it, at this phase, I think it's a different analysis than happens just a little bit later when you start to go through what I call is kind of with a fine tooth comb you know, where you really take a look at what does this language mean? I know what it's supposed to mean, but what did this general practitioner actually draft here? Right. And, you know, it's fair to say that most people going into these, you know, uh, premarital agreements, the objective obviously uh, oftentimes is to carve out separate property and, and, um, you know, and but how it actually f does that in detail is what you're talking about with the fine tooth comb. Yeah, many of the prenuptial agreements that are coming across my desk these days have. Um, I, I want to use the word hyper, very, very specific definitions of marital and separate property. And so they're defining marital property as relating to assets. A normal one is going to say everything that's listed on exhibit A is my separate property. Um, what I'm seeing now are ones that say the separate property is all the property that we bring into the marriage, including the stuff that's on A. See how that's just a little bit different. Or you can be looking at an agreement that says um, uh, all of my separate property is all of my separate property, except for the growth that may be existing on these assets or the following list. It's a very particularized look at it. Now, we, we mentioned there was no date for Eric and, and Melanie's, and we did that on purpose. So let's assume that, you know, they got married uh, in, in 1983. Um, why would that matter um, compared to if they got married in uh, 1998 you know, or, you know, the, when the Broncos won the Super Bowl? So why, why would those two dates uh, differ? Well, there's actually three dates that we're going to be caring about, right? Yeah. There, there are really three different standards under which you're going to approach the validity of a marital agreement. Um, now I get to sound esoteric and say Colorado has recognized marital agreements since the 19th century. And as you go back through there, you can find some very old cases that relate to and enforcing marital agreements. And that really culminates in a Supreme Court decision, um, Newman versus Newman which was decided, I actually don't know the date. I'm going to assume it's 78. Um, I think it was, was 1982. Oh, establishes a common law threshold for um, the determination of a marital agreement. That standard is slightly different than the standard that came into being when the legislature then turned their attention to marital agreements in 1986. Um, and then you have what's called the Colorado um, Marital Agreement Act, the CMAA. And again, standards are a little bit different. That goes forward until we get to the Uniform Marital and Premarital Agreement Act, which becomes effective in July of 2014. And each of those, although they all have common threads, they they're all have similar you know, provisions for the review of maintenance and for agreements concerning property. They all have slightly different themes as it relates to enforceability. Could you uh, just briefly give us an idea of what those themes are? 
Well, under the Newman decision, you really have a theme that says um, you might be stuck with your contract, right? A party to a party should enter into a marital agreement with some caution because they may get what they bargained for. And so Newman really comes forward with a common law, I think, contract approach to marital agreements. When the uh, legislature then adopts the Colorado Marital Agreement Act, it actually changes slightly some of the standards from the Newman approach. And you get into a system that begins the process of not treating a marital agreement as a contract. It starts to become into saying this is a special vehicle because of the relationships that exist between spouses. And so then it sets forth just a slightly different ground rules for testing it. And there is some very good um, case law and legislative history that says those two standards are supposed to be equal and equivalent. And, and, and I understand that's what it says. I understand that's what the courts say about it. It's just not true. They're two different standards. Um, you know, Eric hires you, you've got the premarital agreement, you're feeling good. Uh, you know, there's might be a couple of issues that financial disclosures aren't initial or they're not attached. Um, but you get a call from Melanie's attorney, the divorce attorney that she referenced in the counselor's uh, uh, office. And, you know, the attorney says, we're going to be challenging the validity. We're going to try to sit, you know, seek to set this agreement, um, you know, aside because it's not beneficial to uh, Melanie. What happens then from your, like, just generally from a process standpoint? Well, the conversation with her attorney is important because the first thing I'm going to try to do is to set, I'm going to bifurcate the hearing. I'm going to try to have a different hearing on the validity than I am going to have at the time of the permanent orders, because that's really going to save some people, um, uh, you know, financially. It's very expensive to try a permanent orders hearing where you both presume and don't presume the validity of the marital agreement. And is that because deciding the value or the disposition of marital property is going to change dramatically depending on if the v agreement is or is not valid. So we're going to first decide, okay, how are we going to deal with, with property and who gets what, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, a little uh, teaser, we're, you know, new to the podcast world, but this is a teaser, uh, Jim, so follow me. Uh, and that Dr. Dre, we're going to talk about later on, that that case has been recently set for um, a validity hearing. So, um, okay, let's, that's what you're doing. How do you get to that validity hearing and what are the things that uh, you're doing? Are you going to reach out to Eric's um, attorney, the general practitioner, and, and ask him for uh, things? We're going to reach out to everybody and ask everybody for things. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, we're probably going to start by issuing some discovery out to um, wife that's going to talk about why she, so that she can set forth every reason why she thinks that the agreement is not valid. And then we'll tailor, you know, some discovery and some of our exploration to try to meet those needs. So if she says, well, I signed it on the day of the wedding, okay, that, that's a defense. We can start to tailor our defense for that. Um, she says, I didn't have an attorney. Well, we can have a, a conversation about what that looks like. But generally, you're going to want to issue discovery. And then the next step is to get the attorney's files. You both want your client's file and you also want the other side's file. So you're um, going back to the general practitioner and you're saying, hey, give me your billing statements, give me, give me your drafts, uh, all the things that you have in your file. And then Melanie's attorney, this the, the same thing? Absolutely. Well, I, why is that? Why is that? Melanie's attorney is different because you've got attorney client privilege issues that are going to lurk through and be waived. So that's not a phone call. That's a different, slightly different process. But I want to have a conversation with the attorney about what happened and then get a copy of his file very early in that process. And, and the reason would you agree uh, is that, you know, the billing statements show kind of the negotiation, show the time lapse, show the kind of various, you know, things that uh, that attorney is is doing in the drafts. You know, Amy and I had a previous episode where we really talked about the negotiation being important and the drafts being important. Can you comment on why that might 
uh, be important to get you know to see that evidence in the in the file? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to define it this way, which is to say that there is a question of voluntariness, whether you're going to call that voluntary or duress, and an agreement that's been negotiated. There's been a rational opportunity to review it and to discuss it. And so that's what you're looking for as you go back through a negotiation process. An agreement that has been negotiated, I think it's relatively hard to say, I signed it subject to duress. And there's case law that clearly suggests that. Right. And and then you would see like on that signature block to the kind of agreement that there was a notary and then you would then, you know, see, ask that notary to, you know, be in a deposition and ask them if they can remember, was there force, was there coercion, was there duress at the time of the signing? Yeah, exactly. Um, what, how would you, uh, I mean, th these cases, they can often be 10, 20 years. How do you deal with that? Because people's memories can oftentimes, I mean, if the, well, if the general practitioner for Eric says, I don't know what you're talking about, or I don't have the copy of his file. I think you, you start to talk about, is it your business practice? Is it your business practice to make sure that he understood the agreement? Is your business practice to make sure that, you know, she had disclosures? Is it your business practice to make sure that she didn't sign it under duress? Had you seen duress, would you have done something to stop it? And so the attorney themselves, while they can't remember, their business practice is relevant towards determining um, what they did or their conduct at the time of the execution. And that, by the way, that's especially true of the notaries. Um, the notaries, as they're approaching these issues, never remember what this person is. And you're hoping, you know, if they have their notary book still and it hasn't been retained somewhere else, they the only questions you're going to get from them are business practice. Is it your business practice to let somebody who is crying hysterically sign an agreement? Is it your, you know, and approach it that way. Right. Because, I mean, most of the time these notaries, they're signing deeds. They're signing, they're they're kind of the go to person in these law firms. And, you know, they've notarized hundreds of 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 documents and probably can't remember 10 years later. Um, and if they do, that might mean something because they might say, I remember that there was a woman crying um, and that might, you know, be an issue. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Also, the notaries are coming from banks. Um, and so you have to be cognizant that a bank person isn't going to have any memory at all. And Jen, do you find it helpful um, to depose any of the friends or family that were at the wedding, like if there's a duress claim? It's going to depend really upon what's going on with the duress claim. And I'm going to change duress to voluntariness. Um, and so you're going to want to have, I would have a conversation with my client's friends and my client's family. That's, in, you know, that is something that I assume is going to be more supportive of at least our positions. If I start to hear an interesting tale, whether it's in the discovery responses or whether it's going to be from my own client's witnesses, only then will I start to say, let's talk with, you know, Melanie's parents. Let's have a conversation with some of the other friends. Um, perhaps I'm even going to kick out a, uh, a, you know, a private investigator to go interview potential witnesses to try to get a state or a sense of what's going on. Um, so we've talked to him a lot about, you know, depositions and discovery, um, you know, when Eric has come into your office and when you're dealing with Melanie and Melanie's attorney, um, at what point, you know, are experts involved in these types of cases? Well, you, you have to be careful um, as you're approaching experts in these type of cases. You're... In, my suggestion would be you're always approaching somebody first as a consultant. And so the attorney hires somebody to consult with who may have um, some more broader information about what some particularized issues are. You're trying to do that to preserve privilege um, and to preserve a work product. If the consultant says, you know, you're, you're screwed, you got big ass problems here. You want that to be in a, in a mechanism that's not gonna permit it to be disclosed to the other side. Once you've gone through the consultant phase, you can have a conversation about whether or not you can have an expert. 
and that is not necessarily going to be granted by the court. Um, experts who are testifying as to marital agreements are testifying as to questions of law, and questions of law are within the, quote, exclusive um, province of the trial court. And knowing that, um, when you issue an expert report, you always reference that because most judges will permit expert testimony on these matters because they want the opportunity to be educated. They're looking for as much information as they can get. They want to go beyond the mere arguments of counsel and hear somebody tell a story about why this agreement is or is not enforceable. So you have this great dialectic, right? This this tension between what the law provides and what reality is. And you have to be prepared to address that as a practitioner. And how did it come about in your practice? Um, you know, you've served as a consultant before in these types of cases, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Way, way back when the world was pure and I was a young baby attorney, I started to go through the process of litigating, you know, as the associate, right? I'm the pasty faced kid who's been the back of the library going through the cases, you know, from the time of the Magna Carta to the present. And I, I built up some expertise just from doing that as my you know, supervising partner was trying the case, which then I transitioned into starting to try my own cases. Um, as that happens, I was invited to write the um, Colorado Practitioner's Guide to Domestic Relations Law with Steve Epstein. And so as we formulated that, I started to develop a little bit of a reputation. Okay, and put that over to the side there. Um, at the same time, we, we had a series of interesting marital agreement cases that I was working on that really involved, and I had said the question of combing the agreement. Um, we developed something that we call polishing the stone, which was just to work the agreement over as much as you possibly can to see, we were trying to set it aside, to see what you can do to set aside an agreement that on its face um, looked to be valid. And, and so with that and the culmination of those experiences, um, you would start to have informal conversations with attorneys. Somebody calls me up, hey, I got a question. You have a conversation. And that very quickly developed into more than an informal relationship. When an attorney really wants to sit back and to say, hey, let's have a conversation about the discovery that we should be issuing here. Um, let's have a conversation about, you know, different approaches. Let me, are there any landmines? And the kind of review process that a uh, an expert can give you is different because they're not an advocate. They're supposed to be looking at it from a neutral standpoint. Whereas as an advocate myself, um, I, I am profoundly guilty of believing my own BS. And so whenever the attorney looks at the agreement, they're always looking at it through a set of glasses that are slightly rose colored. And a consultant's not going to do that for you. So say that um, we'll change the scenario a little bit. Let's say that instead of you wearing the hat of um, Eric's attorney, that Eric's attorney calls you as a consultant. Can you walk through the process as to what you do in that scenario when you get a call from an attorney asking you to be, be a consultant? Yeah, it's really not that different. I mean, the, generally, the attorneys will call me and ask me to be an expert first, and then I will be shifting our relationship into one of a consultant. Um, as I'm approaching it, I'm always starting with, do you really need a consultant here? Is there something about this agreement that's going to warrant that expense or not? And, you know, the first call is always free, right? And so you can have a long conversation. You can look at the agreement. You can give them some. Usually I get involved in other people's cases with a telephone call from an attorney. And we're going to start to have a conversation about what the kind of issues are really with the intention of trying to decide what they're looking for and what they might need. Um, there are marital agreements that are simple, they're clear, they appear to be valid. I'm not so sure what I can offer as either an expert or as a consultant. But when they do make the call, they're usually looking for an expert. I usually try to transition them off of the 
at the beginning into a consulting role um, just because I've seen enough of these where I can help. I can help draft the discovery. I can help um, set up what the defenses might look like. Once we've gone past that consultant, then we have a conversation of what trial is going to look like um, and how whether or not you need to have expert testimony on it. Who is your judge? Again, um, in these areas, uh, many judges won't permit uh, testimony because it's an area of law, in which case we're going to have a conversation about, do you want me to enter as co-counsel and to argue these issues to the judge as a, quote, um, someone who's more familiar with them as you're going through it? And then the final real expression comes from drafting the opinion. I always try to make sure that people understand uh, I'm not an advocate when I'm an expert. I have to have an opinion that I actually believe. And um, sometimes that can be hard for attorneys to hear if your opinion is different than the one that they're hoping it's going to be. Well, and, and Jim, you know, there have been without, you know, referencing specific cases, uh, I have called you and asked you about, you know, whether you could help me out on a case and you said, nope because I don't agree with what you're trying to, to your client and you are trying to do. So, you know, which I appreciate, you know, you're a straight shooter. Um, so, but I think that that's helpful at the onset to kind of understand what, you know, what your role is. There's a foray that's going on here that we should talk about, which is, I'm going to call it the Costanza effect, which is a, a, a litigant or, and a litigator are always looking through stuff through their own eyes. And so there are cases where I've taken a look at an outcome and I so fervently believe in that outcome until hypothetically I lose, if I ever lose. And then you look at it and go, oh yeah, that makes complete sense, right? That, oh, of course that's right. That's the way it should have been. Just because you're so trained to advocate as an attorney. So Jim, let's change the scenario a little bit. Let's say that Eric um, you know, and Melanie, they entered their agreement, their marital agreement in Colorado and then moved to another state and we're getting divorced in another state. And you get a call from Eric's attorney who is in, let's say, California. Um, you know, does that happen? Do you serve as a consultant for um, out-of-state divorces? Well, yeah. And one is out-of-state divorces or in-state divorces with out-of-state prenuptial agreements require expert testimony because then the court is not the exclusive determiner of the law because it's the law of another jurisdiction. And so under those cases, it's appropriate to opine to the court um, what the law is. And it, it's clear that the court is going to be, um, is going to require some education on what the law of Colorado would be as opposed to California and you're going to get into some of those issues. And so one, whenever someone walks in with to my office with a marital agreement from another state, my first call is let's try to figure someone to have a conversation about what this means um, before we go forward. And it's a very frequent call that I get from other jurisdictions. And, and Jim, to kind of put uh, an exclamation point on that, that point is, you know, if someone is in Chicago and they have a, a premarital agreement drafted by a, you know, a Chicago divorce lawyer, and then they move to Boulder, and the premarital agreement says Illinois law you know, applies, you're having to reach out to an Illinois you know, a, a expert on Illinois law because it's different than Colorado law. And then the vice versa, if someone has a premarital agreement or a marital agreement, in Colorado and then moves, you know, to, to California, they're having to, and it has a choice of law provision for Colorado. They're having to, to apply Colorado law, you know, in that circumstance, which they're unfamiliar with. Yes, that's correct. I agree with that. Okay. So let's change the scenario a little bit. So Eric and Melanie um, walk out of the counselor's office and they reach an agree an oral agreement that their retirement accounts are separate property. Um, and then Melanie goes to file for divorce. What happens under that scenario? So that's the Xander case. Um, the Colorado Supreme Court just came down with an opinion that addresses those issues. Um, and I have to be somewhat careful what I say because I assisted in drafting an amicus brief in the case. Um, but the Colorado Supreme Court really made it clear that there is a different approach to 
marital agreements than there might be for contracts. And so if somebody has an oral contract, that oral contract is almost always enforceable, especially if there's been some performance. That's a contractual remedy. And we can modify the terms of a contract orally if we do so um, you know, under specific circumstances. The Supreme Court has really said that's no longer holding true for marital agreements that marital agreements are required to be in writing, that you can't have an oral marital agreement and have it comply with the Colorado Marital Agreement Act. And can you talk a little bit about um, the partial performance argument and how that's important in that decision? Well, I, I think the partial performance argument is more than important in the decision. I think, um, well, one is the Xander decision says that under the Colorado Marital Agreement Act, that partial performance is not sufficient, that you can't prove the existence or waive the writing requirement by establishing partial performance. Um, there are questions about, notice how carefully I say that, there are questions about the way that the um, Xander decision is applying to what is the new law. And so under the Colorado Marital Agreement Act, that's what Xander was interpreting when it entered into its order. Now you're gonna transition that over to the Uniform Marital and Premarital Agreement Act. I'm not sure that that transition is going to be um, you know, equivalent or straight. The, languages have, uh, the language of the act has very specific, um, the very specific inclusion of defenses um, that are not available under the CMAA. And so I think the we all will get the opportunity here in the next five or so years to have the to litigate partial performance under the Uniform Marital Agreement Act. Yeah, so it possibly could have a different outcome. Yeah, Jim, you know, one thing I wanted to clarify, what's an amicus brief? Can you for people that don't know what amicus means, uh, what, what is that? OK, I'm, I'm going to answer that with a long story. So grab a cup of coffee. Um, Back when the world was pure, right, I clerked for the Chief Justice of the Colorado Supreme Court, Louis Rivera. And um, one of the questions that would come up in briefs and would come up to the judges, all we got to do was to write memos for the court, uh, would come up to the judges was a question of, are they looking for some of the public policy issues or some of the specialized area of law as they're approaching their decision? And when they want that, they will request um, amicus briefs. And an amicus brief, amicus means friend. It's a, you know, you're tendering a brief as a friend of the court arguing from a public policy position. And so as I write, as I assisted in the draftsmanship of a portion of the Xander amicus brief, I was writing it on behalf of the um, Colorado Bar Association, Family Law Section, Amicus Brief Committee. And you get, you know, that detail trying to present the positions of the Colorado Bar Association, Family Law Section to the court and advising it the way that we were viewing um, the case law and the outcome that we thought would be appropriate. So in the in the future, if there's a case, I mean, there's no case reported opinion or guidance really on the uniform act because it and you referenced earlier it was it was passed in um i think it was passed in 2013 but then enacted july of 2014 and we just haven't seen even though there's been a surge of of divorces with covid we just haven't seen any opinions kind of make their way up to give some guidance on how to apply that but if it was then you know in, in that circumstance you might be writing of a, a, an amicus amicus brief in connection with the law on the uniform uh colorado you know act right well yes and no um i i think that an amicus brief is an honor to write and it's an honor to be able to write on behalf of a community um it's really the community that asks you to do that the court simply asks for the brief um, and right now, I think we're starting to see that first wave of the Uniform Marital Agreement Act, the new act, the first wave of divorces come through here where we're testing those agreements. And so I think we'll see some guidance from the Court of Appeals um, on these areas. I'm, 
I'm sure that I will have the opportunity to participate in that guidance. I'm, I'm sure you will. Um, let's uh, switch kind of our to our final gear and and you know let's give some guidance to you know before we started recording. You mentioned your sons are into the Grateful Dead. Let's talk about Dr. Dre, uh, another musical. Um, icon. So he's going through a divorce in California when we're recording this. Um, he's represented by the the um, divorce diva uh, Laura Wasser, who represents all the kind of Hollywood stars. Um, and and they have set a, a hearing. His wife is there was a premarital agreement. I, I think it was 1996. So in Colorado, it would fall within the CMAA. Uh, and she's claiming his wife reportedly is claiming you know the coercion. How would you like what were the questions that you would ask if if you were representing Dr. Dre or kind of your general observations if you were like a judge in that case on the coercion claim? Yeah, I'm going to change coercion to voluntary again, um, because the, the standard and the question here is if you're talking about duress or coercion, the issue is, did the person act of their own free will? And it's not a question of. Um, merely making you know a good or a bad decision in the moment it's a question where somebody actually usurps your ability uh, to make a, a decision freely and so that's the question of um, duress as you're approaching it someone who's represented by an attorney it is in my humble opinion relatively hard to prove coercion because one would assume that the attorney is operating as a buffer between you know, what's going on. Now, having said that, there is case law that um, can find coercion in a variety of different settings. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there there's the Moore v. Moore case in Texas, um, you know, and you look at all these other uh, states, but in Moore v. Moore, um, if I remember it co correctly, it was, you know, they, they basically um, had a straw man for the wife's attorney. And, you know, the, he, the husband said, you know, your attorney has signed off on this agreement. And the, the straw man, the attorney hadn't really um, done that. And the court set it aside. Would you agree if, if you've got two attorneys, you know, competent attorneys, you, you really have to have some plus factors. There really has to be something else going on in order for the court to set it aside. It's a real challenge or uphill uh, climb if there's two attorneys on the other side. I know like Barry Bonds, he, he you know, he established the the law. There's a seminal case in California um, where Barry Bonds, the, you know, the, the San Francisco disgraced slugger at this point. But I think, you know, the facts, if I remember them correctly, is that he had his wife. They signed a prenup in Las Vegas. She didn't have an attorney. And then, you know, they got divorced in, in Barry or in California. One would expect that, you know, Dr. Dre would you know, if there's two attorneys involved, it's going to be very difficult. Um, what about her claim? I mean, she reportedly has said that he tore it up and said, I hate this agreement or this agreement. Can you comment on that in terms of, you know, Colorado and, and how, how that might play out? I think the question is whether or not by tearing it up, he has revoked the agreement. Um, and especially under now the Xander decision that we just talked about, Colorado law is clear that, is that a revocation or amendment modification of a marital agreement has to be in writing. And so the act itself of ripping up the marital agreement, there's a real risk a court's going to say that's not a writing because it's not signed by the parties and there aren't any disclosures that are associated with it. Um, in the same vein is what is the act of tearing it up, right? If the act of tearing it up is I hate this document, that expression doesn't relate to revocation. That's just a, a question of quality. And so as she approaches that, I think she's going to have a, a, a significant uphill battle in proving that the tearing up of the marital agreement effectuated a revocation. Yeah, and, and I've seen cases where a claim of abandonment has come up, which is obviously different than revocation, where you know parties they just d basically disregard. It. And there's actually a couple of cases. There's in remarriage of Zimmerman and some other cases where you know people just dis disregard their agreement um, and you know have a joint business, even though they said they're going to keep everything. And at least from my perspective, that is often the more persuasive argument, but the revocation is a real uh, challenge. And 
I, it's set for five days. I think her attorneys are claiming $2 million in spousal support per month, as well as $5 million. You know, it's all over the news. I think, you know, it, just based on what I've read, she's got a, it, she, she, it's just kind of a, a litigation kind of leverage play where she's just trying to obtain more, more money than uh, what she would otherwise get under the agreement, which is oftentimes what happens in these kind of situations. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, there, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you, though, right? One of the questions that's going to come up, remember, we were talking about the three different standards. The decision, the abandonment issues really are coming up under um, the Newman decision, are coming up as a premarital agreement act. And so there are those of us who have attempted to distinguish them on that ground, saying that you can't abandon an agreement now because it has to be in writing. Uh, those arguments are met with varying success by different, you know, varying judges. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, fair enough. I mean, I think in remarriage of young was the Dutch couple that, you know, they got married in 1954 and then they just disregarded it and the husband forgot about it and, and then found it miraculously, you know, when he got divorced. So, but, um, I, I, at least I find that the kind of cases in the history um, you know, fascinating. Who would in Colorado, just to kind of tie things up, Jim, who would have the burden of proof in uh, a, a challenge to a premarital agreement if Dr. Dre's case uh, was here in, in uh, Colorado? Well, there's really two different burdens that you're going to be approaching. The first one is there is a burden to establish the existence of an agreement. And that will be on the person who wants to enforce the marital agreement. They'll have to show just some of the core requirements. Here's a document. It happens to be a writing. It's signed by people. I would suggest that they're going to have to have at least some information that relates to the disclosure. Once they've done that, the other side or the person who is contesting the validity of the marital agreement bears the burden of establishing that it's invalid under any of the enumerated reasons, whether that's going to be because it's unconscionable, the maintenance waiver provisions, um, the disclosure provisions, they'll also bear the burden of establishing that, um, and especially as it relates to the voluntariness or the disclosure issues. Well, Jim, I, I think that that's a good way to kind of end things. Um, for people that don't know you or are interested in finding out more about you, uh, can you tell our listeners how, how do they get in touch with you? What's the best uh, way to, to uh, find you? The best way to find me is by email. Uh, my email address is J as in Jim, S as in Stuart Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y, at SENLAW, Samuel Edward Nancy, NancyLaw.com. Send me an email. I'm happy to talk. Obviously, I love the sound of my own voice. Uh, well, they, they can't hear the lovely sound of your voice on, on email, but w just in case they want to call you, what's what's a good phone number for you? 303-298-1122. Great. Thank you. Hey, everyone. This is Ryan again. Thank you for joining us on Divorce at Altitude. If you found our tips, insight, or discussion helpful, please tell a friend about this podcast. For show notes, additional resources, or links mentioned on today's episode, visit divorceataltitude.com. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen in. Many of our episodes are also posted on YouTube. You can also find Amy and me at kalamea.law or 970-315-2365. That's K-A-L-A-M-A-Y-A dot law.